Rakshita, wake up, stretch. All right, everybody out there, do a big stretch. Put your hands up high. Big stretch, stretch up as high as you can. Now stretch one arm even higher. Stretch the other arm even higher. Lean way down and touch your toes. Turn all the way around, reach as far sideways as you can. Reach the other way as far as you can. Hands way up. Wiggle your fingers. Okay, are we right. ready? It I is now, we are now, it is 10 o'clock. And so we're going to start our little journey on surviving in different environments. So we're going to look at the whole world and we're going to look at genetics, what makes animals uh, run. We're going to look at the environments in which they live and then we will look at how they become fossils and what fossils tell us about changing environments. My name is Dr. Joyce Bluford. I'm a geologist um, and you just were talking with Debbie Davidson. We'll be your host today. And so welcome third graders from Fremont Unified. So what we will look at today. Now look at that chameleon there. What's happening? It's changing its color. It's going from one color to another. Why does that happen? Have you ever thought about how organisms change and how the environment has something to do with it? Like would this chameleon turn bright blue? No, it, it, it has adapted or it has changed its, its genetics or what we're made up of to, to cope with its environment. So we will then look at how the environment affects organisms, not only a chameleon, but many, many other organisms from the ocean to the land. We will also look at how these animals and other organisms evolve through time. So how and how they become extinct is it because of the environment or is there something in us that makes us go extinct? And we'll look at that fossil record because that is what explains it all. Now, I'm going to introduce you to two big words, just so you understand. There's genetics. That's what our molecules are made up of. You can't really see them. And then there's something called the phenotype or the physical animal. That's where, remember, with the P. Um, so the phenotype, so the genotype gives us codes to make the, the phenotype. And so sometimes change occurs only in the genotype. It's when we see it in the phenotype. Okay, just want to, I know they're big words, but it's a way of saying that inside us, the chemistry of us, is affected by the environment in which we live in, not only us, but many, many other organisms. Okay, again, what is this twirling picture? And if you notice, I have one in the back there too. This is our genetic code. It is basically chemicals or element chemistry is very important that we are made up of. Sometimes, can you see the twirling one and you see the colors? Um, and they repeat themselves. There's only four colors. They can change themselves sometimes, sometimes by the environment, and sometimes uh, they just change on their own. That's called a mutation. And that can change what the physical organism can look at. So we'll look at some of these environmental effects on organisms. It includes what you eat, because even though you're eating oatmeal or uh, sandwich. That is all made out of chemicals too. So diet affects, um, temperature affects, gases that we breathe, because remember around us, these are elements that we're breathing and our lungs take out what? Oxygen, that is an element. So these are all chemicals. Humidity, how wet it is, how not wet. Um, like black mold, for instance, only occurs when there is moisture in the area. Um, light also affects organisms, but most importantly, it's the chemicals and the effect 
on the chemical reaction with the environment. Now, let's look, you're probably going, oh, that's a lot of maybe, how, how can she prove this? Well, it has been noted as far back as the 1800s um, when the Industrial Revolution occurred in United Kingdom or England, they all of a sudden notice a peppered moth, a peppered moth. moth. If you look at the picture on, uh, there's a white one and a black one. The white one is what it looked like. There was no black ones up until the Industrial Revolution. Now, what was that all about? Industrial Revolution was when humans learned how to capture resources like coal and burn it in the air and make energy, so making our lives easier. What they didn't realize was the side effect of that coal. The coal came out as smoke, but it was dark and sooty and black, and it was all made out of uh, carbon elements. Well, what happened was all the trees that were white that the peppered moth lived on were changed into a black soot. And over time, scientists realized that this pepper moth changed from the color of uh, black and white to all black. Why? Because it then could blend in and then so its uh, birds wouldn't eat it. And so this was the first example of people realizing that our environment changes. So if we don't clean the environment and during the Industrial Revolution, that's when they stopped coal burning and they learned about electricity because there was a big problem. We were realizing that people were getting sick because of the coal soot because that's what they were using as energy. And so this was the first change. So the peppered moth, a study by Dr. Edelson during the Industrial Revolution. And this was the beginning of understanding natural selection. And you probably have heard of um, Darwin, Darwin's theories on nat natural selection. This is when we first started to realize the environment changes organisms, not all the time, but sometimes. Now, I would like to read a story called Gimpy the Goose. It's a little poem and it, it's uh, uh, written by a student here in Fremont. We just finished it, but this little goose can help us understand how changes occur. Gimpy the Goose by Therika Tambidure, animated by Hagos Tavolti. One summer day when the sun was high, a goose was limping and could not fly. The goose that looked as big as the moon appeared at Tulipans at Tyson's Lagoon. The goose looked behind a wood chip mound because he heard a nasal sound and was surprised by what he found. Wild Canada geese, white, black, and brown. The new goose began to rejoice. The Canada geese laughed at his silly voice. The funny goose honked a loud hello. Stay with us, you funny fellow. This mysterious goose was different from the rest, buff-colored feathers on his back and breast, with an orange beak with red-black spots, orange and pink feet with small knots. Domesticated gray log, wild to the Eurasian coast, bred by farmers to be cooked as a roast. This goose looks special because of genetics. Breeding is done for food or aesthetics. Passing of features from parents to offsprings, leaving the goose without strong wings. 
breeding specific characteristics known as traits. Thus, different types of poultry breeders create. Genes are passed down from family to family, geese with similar features without calamity. Gimpy the goose, which he is called by the locals, can be heard through the area with his vocals. The gray log goose decided to stay. The Canada geese wanted Gimpy to play. Dr. Conrad Lorenz, a zoologist, used gray log geese to document imprinting behaviors for many a beast. In fall, the Canada geese began leaving one by one, not one to eat nor have fun. Wintry winds soon began to moan. The gray log goose was left all alone. He tried to befriend the ducks in the stream, but Gimpy was lonely without his Canada team. The gray log goose was alone for many a day, but thankfully something happened in May. The Canada geese came back to make their nest. Gimpy the goose was no longer stressed. He protected the Canada gooselings from danger. Gimpy the goose was acting as their private ranger. Children and adults are both quite fond of Gimpy the Goose at Tule Ponds. So if you go to Tule Ponds, that's another place that we run and we also have presentations from there too. Gimpy is running around because he cannot fly and so he's there all the time. But we were always wondering what kind of goose he was. He looked kind of weird and his voice was different than the other goose and we couldn't figure out what had happened and we realized that this was a goose that could not fly because breeders poultry breeders that means like uh, chickens and and uh, geese were bred which means um that they were genetically kind of manipulated a little to create types of animals that people could eat. Now the goose has been domesticated, especially the gray loud, ever since Egyptian times. So this was a way in which farmers could, instead of going hunting, they can create their own food so they could eat it. And so you don't want um, a bird to fly. So what they realized was that you can, they can have the eggs. And then sometimes if one looked a little different, you can take it apart and try to have other eggs with a similar looking um, breed, they call it. It's not a different species. It's still a gray log goose, but it has these traits. And this can happen with genetics. So let's look. This is all coming from, if you see this picture here, it looks like one looks like Gimpy. But if you look really close up, it doesn't have those same features and it doesn't have that honk, honk, honk of him. Now, this is the wild one. Now the wild gray log geese is like the Canada geese is to us in America. Canada geese are wild here. They don't taste very good, so most people will not eat them. Same with the gray log. But when your farmer wants to make um, uh, a roast, like was in the poem, they bred this gray log geese to make different kinds. And this is how they domesticated them. They would get different. So all of these pictures that were in the poem, the African, the American buff, the beacon buff, these are all coming from that one gray log type of geese. Now, this is a changing phenotype. So physically it's moving a little to the point where you can't even recognize it. Like look at that African goose. Look at that little thing underneath its neck. And look, it's black. These guys can change. So humans can manipulate genetics too. Now look at all these guys, domestic. These are all coming from that one wild geese. Over thousands of years these have been bred. Now look at that weird one called a Sebastopol. It has these long feathers. So this is getting close to when the genetics 
can actually change into a totally different species. But that hasn't happened in the gray law. That's why in the poem I use the word calamity. So that means it can change. And this is basically how organisms kind of change slowly as their genetics get manipulated or changes. Now, this is just one of the other things about Gimpy. If you've never been to Tule Ponds, uh, Gimpy's there now. And let's take a look. Gimpy is the resident goose. He's an African goose that came about five years ago. He cannot fly. And every year he always picks two, a male and a female and they're chicks and he watches over them like a nanny. So this year, these are the lucky couple. So notice I called it an African goose there. This was about a year ago. And I didn't really know until we wrote this poem because everybody loves um, Gimpy the Goose at Tule Ponds. And so that's when we realized he wasn't an African goose. He was really just a domesticated gray log. Um, so this is where we start understanding. And also this goose, if you look on the internet, there's a whole lot of stories about domesticated gray logs, especially this type. They're very friendly and they're noted to become very good pets to people. Now, those are the organisms. Let's take a look at is our environment changing and it will, will it affect different organisms? Well, we are kind of changing right now. And what this is showing you is data. Our ice covering is changing. Our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing a little. Uh, our temperature is changing, not wild, but just a little at a time. And will this cause different changes affecting organisms? It can trigger causes in organisms, but we're studying this as scientists. We're looking at these changes and seeing what it actually does. Now we do know change does occur, how it changes, not quite as sure. So this picture here of the changing colors, that is showing the atmospheric changes. And you could see the, the, um, the blue, is uh, changing the atmospheric carbon dioxide and it changes uh, throughout the year. Okay, now our, does that change the Arctic ice covering? Yes, this is looking from 1980s up until the uh, 90s and, or to two, uh, 2000s. If you look at this, the change, of, uh, the change that has occurred is we've lost 35% of our ice caps. Does that affect? Yes. Why it affects it is because the ice caps, we have one on the top and one on the bottom of our earth. When that starts melting, it goes into the ocean. Now the oceans start turning and churning and they create different effects of, um, of how the water interacts and it changes our weather. And over time it can create a change in our climate. Just imagine too, during the ice age, which during the ice age here in Fremont, we used to have lots of big trees and we had megafauna like mastodons and mammoths and saber-toothed cats. That was because the, the weather or the climate during over time was could support large organisms. As the ice age started to go down and reduce, what happened was it changed here in the Fremont area and they went extinct. So the environment and organisms do interplay. Now, this is looking, and this is the data that scientists gather. This is carbon dioxide. You have to remember, we, breathe in air and air has carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, argon. It has all these gases. We breathe it in. And what do, do, what do we use? There's one of those that we use and that is oxygen. But then what do we give back? If we take in oxygen, if our body needs oxygen in our blood, what do we give off? Carbon dioxide. Now, what other organism needs carbon dioxide. Trees, they do something called photosynthesis. That's how they create food for themselves. And they need carbon dioxide. 
and they are friends to us, the trees, because the carbon dioxide that they need, guess what they give off? Oxygen. And over time, they have added a lot of oxygen to our air. So even though we don't see all of this air, this air is our life. Because without oxygen, enough oxygen, what happens? We die. So this is collecting data and tracing it over time. Now, does this affect the temperature? Yes, it does. So this is again, another model of how the temperature has changing and how the melting of our poles are, is causing change throughout our world. Now, there's another thing, especially, you know, probably notice we got some weird weather. We haven't had, we've had drought. What happens if that drought continues? Could humans survive in this area? Well, we also need, we not only need oxygen, but we also need water. And so we, we know that civilizations like the Egyptians in Africa, the Northern part of Africa, they lost their water and their civilization died off. Also in South America in the Andes, the changing of, and if you notice, I have something called El Nino and El Nina. This is when different types of water masses changes weather patterns. So water is very important. So this is why environments are important to look at. They do affect us. Now, global temperature changes. Now, if you look at this real quick, this is changing from 1950 to 2013. And you can see the colors changing, but what the heavier colors mean is that we have had global changes since 1950 we have increased our temperature just a little, not a lot, but it's enough to cause the melting of our, of our poles due to increased temperature and then the changing of the weather cycles. And also, do humans play a part? Yes, they do. We have noticed because of the industrial revolution and how we use our resources and what goes into the air, Urbanization, which means the growth of cities, do cause problems. Now, we sometimes don't look at our organisms, but let's look underneath the water. Marine creatures feel the changes. Coral reefs in Australia and in Florida are dying off. Look at these pictures before and after, and this is just occurring in the last 50 years. Now, and you probably say, well, corals don't matter. Well, it does because corals are these like little kind of cities, industrialized cities or farming areas where it's producing a lot of food for fish. And do we eat fish? Yes. So we have to take care of not only our land and our atmosphere, but our hydrosphere, our oceans, they're very, very important. Now, if an old tree could only talk, would they tell you information? Well, trees don't talk like that big redwood on the right, but they do leave signals. Huh? How do they leave signals? Well, they tell you, we look at tree rings and tree rings can tell you how much carbon dioxide and oxygen they have kind of used. There's ways of looking at the changes in the atmosphere. So these guys have told us, when you look at these old trees, because you have to remember trees can live for a long time. We know that some species of trees can even live up to a thousand years and it leaves records. Now, notice too, the dam below. This is what happens during a drought. Now you probably go, oh, it's water. We'll just get some more river or just turn the faucet on. But that isn't what happens. If we lose our water sources, we lose the ability for drinking water. But also, why do we make dams? Dams produce electricity. And so although we say, well, we can get rid of um, you know, car carbon from gasoline cars, if we do not keep our water supply in check, we won't have electricity. And electricity is important to run all of these. So these 
are important to look at the world as a whole picture because the environment is just that. <coughs> now, so are trees affected? Yes. Notice what they're doing down in Brazil. They're cutting the Amazon because they want to urbanize. Will it affect? Yes, it will affect, especially that carbon dioxide oxygen ratio. And so if you look at the data, so if you look at just our forest um, here in uh, California, we have seen that our trees are dying, not only from fire, but they are dying from other things that are occurring in, in the world. And so we have to protect our environment. We live together as one organism, um, the earth and all the other organisms that live there. So do we want to flatten our forests? No, no, no. Now, is there evidence of this in the fossil record? So the trees give us, because uh, we could actually take cores of the trees and look inside the, the living tree. But is there other evidence that that um, also tells us what's going on. Yes, fossils. We have had fossils for the last, oh, almost a billion years. And those billion years have shown an evolution of organisms. You have to remember when an organism goes extinct, they will never come back because the genetics and the changing of that genetics takes a long time and takes certain things to happen for them to change. And they rarely Rarely, we have no of no evidence where something comes back. Like for instance, the dinosaurs. Will we have a T-Rex again? No, they do not come back. So that's one, um, as a geologist, that's one of our uh, laws. Um, so extinction means forever, but they tell us a story. So if you look at that picture on the right, you see three words, Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic. In the Paleozoic, most of the organisms were little because there wasn't as much oxygen in the air. Matter of fact, there wasn't many trees at all then that uh, the whole land had to kind of change. Then as the Paleozoic ends, then all of a sudden we had these big giants. We had the dinosaurs. Now we don't have anything. Well, we do have the great, um, the blue whale that is that was as large as the largest um, dinosaurs that we found and actually it's larger but that's in the ocean now and then if you notice in the Cenozoic they went from big big giants to still bigger than we had today during the Cenozoic that's when we had our megafauna here in Fremont and in Fremont uh, which we'll discuss in a little bit, we had mastodons, mammoths, uh, saber tooths. These are much bigger than the animals that we have today. Um, they were even bigger than the megafauna in Africa. Now, Africa, we still have the uh, elephants, but will they survive? This is something that we need as humans because humans have, what do we have? Brains and brains, uh, we have big brains that can think and we have to think about how to, for all of us to live together. Now, one of the things that we wanna look at is that the present is the key to the past. So we know about these organisms, even though they're extinct, we look at their ancestors that might be living today, just like the dinosaurs, their ancestors are probably um, the birds. And so we can look at their genetic makeup and then we can compare, except when you go back to the dinosaurs, we don't have any um, genetic makeup. So how do they tell a record? Well, look at what's happening there. The animal dies, falls down to the bottom, and notice what is left from the animal. Only the hard parts. So things like jellyfish might not be, will unlikely be preserved. It does not have a hard part. Now notice too here is that the, the bones would get broken up. And so when you look at these fossils, you have to think about what's happened to them. Who ate them? Where were they covered? Did another storm come a million years later and change it? So um, paleontologists 
and geologists working together can figure out, paleontologists are people who study, study these fossils. When you look at them, you have to look at the whole story and then you have to interpret. We are like detectives. We're looking at an earth that's evolving through time and that helps us to predict the future. Now, let's take a look at some of these, uh, these animals that give us uh, answers. Now, these, this, we're gonna go back to the Eocene. We're going to back about, about 10 million years ago. That's nothing in time. And this is um, some uh, rocks that we find. It looks like a shale. Actually, it's a chalk. It's what teachers used to use as chalk. Um, and when you look at them under the microscope, there's these microscopic organisms called radiolarians. Now, radiolarians are no bigger. If you plucked your eyelash and looked at the diameter, they're no bigger than that. These are the little guys that I studied as a scientist. Um, I looked at how they evolved through time and tried to figure out what did they tell us. Now here, these rocks here are in the Bay Area and it tells of a time that we were underwater. Can you imagine all of San Francisco, all of the Sierra um, Mountains, all were underneath water at one time especially during um, when the dinosaurs roamed during the Mesozoic. And these little guys, they, they, were, they were eaten by other organisms. And then they were, usually what happens is you, you live, somebody else eats you. Then that person, that organism that eats you poops. And then your poop starts going down into the ocean. And then usually something else eats the poop because everything is eaten in the ocean. And then as you come down to the bottom of the ocean, there's these whole layers of these poops. And in the poop, it gives us these layers. And then what I do is I look at these, we call them cores, and we look at the bottom and we see is there changes. And yes, we have found many, many changes over time. So that is a uh, radiolarian. I know big word for little organism. And in our museum, we do have, you can actually look under the microscope. Now let's take a look at our hills. How many of you have walked up to Mission Peak or tried to mis walk up to Mission Peak, especially behind um, Ohlone uh, College? If you go back in there, notice there's rocks up there. And those rocks tell another story. That tells a story where it went from um, very deep water to more shallow water. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Am I telling you that Mission Peak was underwater? Yes. Now, did the water be, was higher or was Mission Peak lower? Well, Mission Peak was lower. It, later on, in, uh, when you get in the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh grade, you'll start learning about plate tectonics, about how the earth has moved up. Now, if you go up to Mission Peak, you see the same picture that I have on the right. You see those little things like that? What are those? What could they possibly be? Well, let's take a look at, what is this, guys? This is a shell. Now, if you look on the side of the shell, you'll notice that it, it's kind of cupped like that. And that cupping, what you see up there, all of Mission Peak, was underwater and there was lots of shell fossils. If you look at, um, I have another picture here. And this probably, this looks like on the, if you're looking down on it, but do you see it's the same kind of shell that you would find. So Mission Peak was underwater at one time. So these are clues that we start putting this picture together of an evolving earth. Now, let's take a look. Let's go to the Ice Age. Let's go to a time period called the Irvingtonian. This is what you would see here in Fremont. Irvingtonian, hmm, that sounds familiar. Irvington is where these fossils were found. Um, and we have, that's what we have in our museum here. We are preserving them for you guys to come and see when the pandemic is over. Um, and you would see evidence. This is what Fremont looked like one 
million years ago. We had the Colombian mammoth. We had saber-toothed cats. We had prehistoric um, camels and horses and sloths and pronghorn antelopes. We had mastodons. But we also had things like vultures. We also had things like, if you notice down there, there's a little turtle, um, the Western turtle. And we also had raccoons. And we also had other organisms um, that are with us today. But our whole megafauna died out, died out. Oh my goodness, it died out. Um, that is our changing environment. Why did the, these guys went extinct? They tried to live on. They lived uh, probably up to about 10 to 5,000 years ago. We're not quite sure of that time period, um, but they have died. We used to have big rivers. And although the Pleistocene is noted for the ice age, Fremont here was warmer and we had a lot of vegetation, lots of trees. Just think about it, guys. How much does a mammoth eat? about 800 pounds a day. Fremont doesn't have enough trees to supply one mammoth for a year. And so it lost its food source and they went extinct. Now, these are some other pictures. These in the upper left-hand corner, these are called the boy paleontologists. Back in the 1940s, they found a lot of these fossils. And these, these are just pictures from way back when. The bottom picture there is a mammoth teeth. So Fremont was just so lucky. And you're just so lucky to live here in Fremont that you can come see them. Now, let's visit the Grand Canyon. Why do I wanna visit the Grand Canyon? I wanna look at these layers. So we're going to look at this little kind of video. And as you can see, you can see these layers and these layers, we can connect them. If you go down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you will see rocks and in the rocks, you will see fossils and you can correlate. What that means is if you have fossils here, and then you have them here and they look the same in there, you can make the assumption that they were at once together and their environment was similar. So you can map out the whole region and that's what geologists and paleontologists do. We have looked throughout the world and we look at how the whole earth has changed. And the Grand Canyon is one of the America's great treasures in that it shows us a changing environment all the way back to the Paleozoic when organisms live up until the Mesozoic. Now, so the story tells us that layer one is older. And as you go up, it would be younger. And this is how geologists can tell time is that we look at these fossils through time. So the fossils tell us time, but they also tell us about an environment. Like for instance, you would never see a whale on, on land because they just live in the ocean. If you see them on land, it has to have been a fossil or something, and then you can make the connections. Remember I use that term, the present is the key to the past. Now, what I would like to do with you right now is I wanna go back through time with dinosaurs. Um, this is, I want you to look at these different times of when the dinosaurs ruled. So we're going to go back to the Mesozoic and we're going to look at the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. So without further ado. Going back through time with dinosaurs, Misadventures of a Student Paleontologist by J.R. Bluford, animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tewaldi, read by Phoebe Chen. School has become very strange lately. My substitute teacher does not believe we are student paleontologists. She keeps saying that we don't need to learn about dinosaurs. She only knows about TV dinosaurs and gets confused when we ask her questions about them. She thinks that the study of dinosaurs is just about big, old, dumb lizards. 
She thinks that dinosaurs lived with other prehistoric animals like mammoths. All of us looked in horror. Dinosaurs lived long before mammoths. I hope she doesn't believe that humans lived with dinosaurs. Cartoons and movies that show people with dinosaurs are just for fun. She read us a few books about dinosaurs and how they were cute. A lot of authors must not realize that dinosaurs were real creatures with their own environment and living conditions. Dinosaurs were not very cute. Dinosaurs did not wear shoes nor talk on phones. They did not have clothes or play musical instruments. Dinosaurs did not shave when they got up in the morning. Dinosaurs did not go to work and write reports. Human adults sometimes have a very weird imagination. Our substitute teacher gave us dinosaur models to sort into pink, blue, purple, and other colors. Who is she trying to fool? Dinosaurs did not come in these colors. There were many dinosaurs that lived in many places. They walked upright and were very successful land animals. They are extinct, meaning they will not evolve on Earth again. They are gone forever. Paleontologists group dinosaurs according to information from fossils. There are many types of fossils, including bones, footprints, eggs, and coprolites, or fossil poop. It is difficult to figure out where they belong with just this data. They were not all reptiles, birds, or mammals. There is not enough evidence to group all the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are usually divided into two different groups, the Saurischia and the Ornithischia. Their fossil bones look different, especially their hips. Saurischia include carnivore dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, and Deinonychus. Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus are herbivores that are included in this group. The Ornithischia include dinosaurs like Stegosaurus, Ankylosaurus, Myosaurus, and Triceratops. This is the kind of science student paleontologists want to learn. The substitute teacher tries so hard, but I really miss our regular teacher. I started to daydream in class about observing dinosaurs as they really lived. In my dream, my mission was to find out where and when the different types of dinosaurs lived. I traveled in my new ship machine, the Dino Express, to seek out the truth. My destination was the Mesozoic, which was between 248 to 65 million years ago. When did the dinosaurs first appear? My ship brought me to 228 million years ago during the Triassic. Pangaea was a supercontinent before the Triassic. It started to break up into two large continents, Gondwana and Laurasia. I walked around in the Triassic. It was very warm with trees like cycads and conifers. There were no evidence of grasses or flowers during this time. Small, fast dinosaurs first appeared and evidence of mammals were found. Carnifex, a reptile, roamed the swamps of North America. I investigated the Triassic shallow seas. They, they were inhabited by the world's first large marine reptiles, like the ichthyosaurs. I went skydiving with pterosaurs or flying reptiles. We were all soaring, except they were looking for little critters to eat. A Coelophysis saw me peeking through the plants. When I saw his sharp, backward-curving teeth and long, strong legs, I knew it was time to travel to the Jurassic. I got into my ship and continued through time into the Jurassic. 
the dinosaurs were thundering across the landscape. I spotted new types of mammals and marine reptiles. The land masses were breaking up. Shallow seas were now covering the earth. I needed an umbrella in the warm and wet land. Large trees, cycads, and ferns continued to thrive. I had to hide from the large dinosaurs who ruled many of the continents. I saw new types of mammals and marine reptiles. I saw beautiful Archaeopteryx, the first reptile with feathers. I did not want to leave, but I had to continue through time. My last stop was the Cretaceous, which started to look more like today. Many of today's plants and animals appeared on Earth. I was not afraid because most of the giant dinosaurs were gone. I walked with friendly duck-billed dinosaurs and saw large herds of triceratops. I saw familiar plants and small mammals. However, I was always looking for one of the largest meat-eaters of all time. Tyrannosaurus hunted during the Cretaceous, and I did not want to be his next dinner. I realized that dinosaurs were doing real well during the Cretaceous, but something happened. I noticed there were changes in climate, and new animals were changing the food chain. Was I going to witness how the dinosaurs became extinct? I would be famous when I returned to present time. Wake up! My substitute teacher yelled. Did you hear me ask you a question? Uh, no, I replied. Where were you? She inquired. I was in the Mesozoic, I declared, and I'll never know what happened. The whole class laughed. The end, AKA extinction. Okay, so that's just a tale of what happened to the dinosaurs. Now, we would like you, Phoebe is going to show you how to make your own diorama of the Mesozoic uh, time broken into the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Listen on, your teachers have the link to these um, uh, models right here. We're making dioramas of the Mesozoic era today. So we have three different periods within that time, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. So we're gonna be comparing the different organisms, that's plants and animals, that lived in each of these periods. So first we're gonna grab our sheet and use markers or crayons or colored pencils and color in all of these organisms. Then once it's all colored, we're going to grab our scissors and cut them out. So make sure you cut out the little box underneath each organism too and just cut along so you have each of their shapes. And then once that's all done, we're going to grab a piece of construction paper like this and we can draw a little landscape. So here we have some mountains, a sun, a river, so you can draw all different kinds of things. And then we're going to take our cutouts of the different organisms and fold them along the dotted line so that we have a little stand attached to each one. And once that stand is folded, we can use glue or tape to attach them to our construction paper. So you can see here, I have all these glued down. So all of my organisms are standing up straight. But if any of them are falling over or they're just having a hard time staying up, you can use a straw and a pair of scissors to just cut a little piece off and you can see here that I just taped it to the back of my little paper fold out so that it'll stand up straight just like that. So this is a way in which you can actually see what animals survived and not only animals but plants and other things that might have been around back then. So um, we're going to now um, uh, I'm going to show you real quick upstairs um, and then we will ask questions. So get your questions ready. And I am going to go over to share screen and share this. 
this is what happens when you can go upstairs. Now you can see this on our website. If you go to the Children's Natural History Museum, you can have a virtual tour of our area. This is in our ocean room. Um, so each of our rooms, you can see fossils, you can see our marine fossils. And then um, if you can go over to other scenes in here, this is in our dinosaur room. We have dinosaur eggs, coprolites, remember that, the dinosaur poo. We have lots and lots of good stuff. And then our big room is the Pleistocene room. And this room in here, we have these are the fossils from Fremont. So you are welcome to go to our website, which is easy, msnucleus.org and Children's Natural History Museum. We even have a scavenger hunt on there. As you're going through it, you can actually look for certain things that are there. This was created by Lucille's Lucille Zhu. She is a student at uh, Mission San Jose. And this summer, this was her little intern project for us. 